Okay, Christian, here we go. Hi, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the closing plenary session of day one of the Aspen Institute Opportunity Forum National Convening. My name is Monique Miles and I am a vice president with the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I am eager to get into this evening's uh, conversation, but before doing so, I wanted to kick us off by sharing a little context with all of you related to why this particular panel with our esteemed guests was so important to feature at this convening. As we've discussed throughout the day today, we know that there's an unprecedented feeling of loss being experienced right now in our country. Between the triple pandemics of the health crisis, the economic crisis and racial injustice, we wanted to close today with a discussion on the power of the arts, especially music, to mobilize, to organize and to heal. And as we reflect on these themes, we couldn't think of a better artist or a better organization than Trombone Shorty and the Trombone Shorty Foundation. In a moment, we will hear about the impact of music on the life of Troy Andrews, the artist known as Trombone Shorty, and how he has used music to understand the past and has also used it to design innovative music aimed at the future, while touching the lives of many children and young adults in New Orleans and around the world. Today, we will also hear from Bill Taylor, the executive director of the Trombone Shorty Foundation. Together, Troy and Bill share reflections on the power of place, including the famous community of Treme in New Orleans, to mentor, to love, to support, to spur healing, and especially during current times when feelings of isolation and vulnerability may abound. 
Trey and Bill will share the mission and vision of the Trombone Surety Foundation, which is to offer students both a roadmap to focus to allow them to pursue their passion. The goal is to nurture their talent in a way that opens up possibilities and provides a platform for advancement. As you all can imagine, this mission, this vision of Trombone and Shorty Foundation is near and dear to all of our hearts. And so we are so excited to have them with us today to reflect on that mission, to reflect on their work, and especially the ways in which they are supporting the next generation of artists and culture bearers in New Orleans and beyond. We're gonna open up right now with a very brief video a timely video that is about Troy and the impact of COVID on the music scene in New Orleans. And after that, I will be so eager to bring both Troy and Bill into this discussion. What was to be on the calendar in New Orleans this week Jazz Fest, one of the nation's best known and liveliest annual musical celebrations. Instead, New Orleans remains in lockdown, a hot spot in the COVID-19 pandemic, with close to 6,500 cases and over 400 deaths to date. Jeffrey Brown spoke with one of the city's musical ambassadors about the toll the pandemic is taking for our ongoing arts and culture series, Canvas. <laughs> In Tipitina's one of New Orleans' most celebrated jazz clubs, a performance by Troy Andrews, known to the world as Trombone Shorty. But it's a performance without an audience, a song Big Chief played just for us. So Troy, you were supposed to be playing at Tipitina's this week. How does it feel now? It's different. I'm excited to be here because it's somewhat of normal feeling and, and it's really sad at the same time because I can't actually really play a show. Three years ago, he'd shown us the musical street life of his city, even creating an impromptu second line parade outside the Candlelight Lounge, a legendary club in the Treme neighborhood where he'd grown up. These days, there's no dancing in the street outside the club. In early April, its beloved owner, Leona Grandison, died from the coronavirus. Mourners had to resort to what they called a drive-by funeral. It's very different, and I think people that have been through Katrina, it feels as if we're preparing for a storm. And the thing that, that's really uh, weird and eerie to me is that this is a city that thrives on music all day. If there's some saxophone player on St. Charles Avenue playing or someone tap dancing in the French Quarter or a brass band marching up the street, you can hear none of that. And that's the most strangest thing for me in the city, that the heartbeat is music. Andrews is a homegrown star of that culture, a performer since he was a little boy, thus the shorty nickname. And he's played around the world ever since, for the past 11 years with his band Orleans Avenue. We'd been with him in his rehearsal and recording studio, and he spoke with us from there now. What is it that you miss the most right now? I really miss my band and being able to put smiles on people's faces all over the world every day. And, and so that's been a, a bit difficult for me mentally to deal with. But once I get into the studio and start to play, uh, my, my emotions as if I'm playing for those people come out and I'm just by myself. So it's amazing what the music can do for you. Um, and I get lost, literally, I, I don't realize that I'm here playing by myself for five and six hours. And then I walk outside and then reality hits again. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Troy and Bill into this dialogue. And I wanna start off by saying thank you both so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. We are delighted. We are delighted that you both are here with us. And um, you know where I wanna start? I wanna start with that video, Troy, that 
what the music can do for you, because that is the conversation that we came here to have today. And I'm so delighted because what that video also did was it gave our audience insight into, they got to see Treme, they got to see the community, they got to see the people, they got to see some of the flavor and some of the textures that if it's fair to say, I think have all helped to foster this amazing blockbuster artist that you have become. And so part of what where I wanted to start our dialogue this afternoon is to specifically unpack that a little bit. And so when we think about the community of Treme and coming up as a young person in Treme, I'm curious to hear you talk as you reflect on your own success. I'm curious to hear you talk about the role that the community played, including the love, the support, and nurturing that was so key to you becoming the artist that you are. And at the same time, Bill, I hope that we can come to you because I do think that spirit of community that is aimed at fostering and supporting um, young people to chart their paths is the spirit, the, the mission of Trombone Shorty Foundation. So I would love to also hear you talk about that as well. Troy, can we start with you? Yes, uh, it was a blessing for me to be able to grow up in the Treme neighborhood because that was a home of the uh, Kermit Ruffins, my family band, the Reaper Brass Band. And I just remember being a kid, uh, I used to go to school in the French Quarter. Uh, Treme is only separated by one street, St. Claude or Rampart Avenue that separates Treme from the French Quarter. I used to remember going to school and seeing a jazz funeral, a bunch of musicians playing and also coming home from school and seeing people celebrating a birthday or a barbecue, whatever it may be. And everyone in the community, even though they wasn't musicians, they all had music in them. The way they cook, the way they, the way they tell you, come get your food for the plate, they all sing in a note. And the love is still there, even though the, the neighborhood is not the same. We have a few people that's around, um, that's still, the, the old timers are still hanging around. And whenever I go, hang out with them, they're always teaching me and asking me questions and also making sure that I'm keeping my head on straight. That type of love, you can't pay a million dollars to experience that. And, and that's just what the neighborhood does, even still today with a few people that's left. And it's definitely played a tremendous part in my career and the way I carry myself, the way I approach music. Uh, I try to approach it from that neighborhood and the things that I experienced as a kid, just seeing a bunch of brass bands and drums and thousands of people just playing and enjoying music, not even not even for to get paid or anything. That's just what the neighborhood that, as you can see in that video, I literally showed up and there was a few people in the neighborhood, those old timers still hanging out that was there when I was born and still there. And we just get some music going and they just start dancing, you know, like I don't, there's no other place like that. It's a very magical neighborhood. And without that place, I don't think I would be here speaking with you guys today. I love that. Thank you so much, Troy. Bill? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, that makes our city unique is we're all, people come here from all over the world and have historically, it's a real melting pot here. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that New Orleans does is it takes from everybody's history, their past, their tradition, and it merges it together here into one thing, one culture, one, one heritage. And that's a living, breathing thing, you know, that, that evolves over time. And at the heart of that are, is creativity. And I, I hesitate to even just say music because it's more yeah. than that. It's, it's mm -hmm. artistic expression, it's mm -hmm. cultural engagement. And we are all bound together by that here. There is a priority placed on creativity, on not just the past, but using the past to inform the future here. Mm. So it's this beautiful mixture of cultures from all over the world coming together, but constantly moving it forward. And when you take a look at what you saw there from Troy, you know, with his band, one of the things that, that I, every time I watch them play, I'm seeing something so modern, yet rooted in hundreds of years of history at the same time. Yeah. And he carries that forward. And that's, that's what a, a strong culture does. It takes from the past and it moves it powerfully into the future. And, and New Orleans does that in a magical way. 
So I want to I want to actually weave a couple of themes together from what you both shared because you have so beautifully articulated the very unique and vibrant culture of New Orleans, Troy. As you were as you were answering, you know, I got this picture of how people come together, and I thought of even my own experience of being in Louis Armstrong Park in New Orleans and literally seeing a second line like like form, and then before I knew it, there were people like out of nowhere and people were just dancing and moving and and so having had that that experience I, I feel like that that's what you described how it just really brings community together and serves as an anchor but then there's this other thing that you talked about bill which is is um the the history and it is a history of culture coming together of artistic expression as you described and part of where I want to go now given that we know that there's so much to learn from the history of artistic expression that has resulted in music this this fabric of our lives so I, I'd be curious to hear because Troy we got some of this from the video as you look around New Orleans now, and, and you can both maybe see and feel the impact of COVID-19, really curious to hear both of you share reflections on really what you have learned from the resiliency of music, like, like what are those lessons? And as you think about the current situation that we're in, what are the implications for the next generation of musicians and the culture bearers who help to carry those lessons forward? Well, I think, uh... The city, the city is so resilient. And a couple of months ago, I really didn't hear any music. You know, I can hear the street cars going up the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a city, like I said in that video, we need music. We didn't realize how important music was to, to, to the city of New Orleans until Katrina happened. And we, we had to move to Texas and different places and we just couldn't come outside and experience what you experienced at Armstrong Park. And I think if we can get through the COVID-19 situation uh, and the kids, who, well, to be honest with you, in the last couple of weeks, this city is so strong that even though it's dangerous right now, I was happy to see that some bands got together and they just paraded because they needed to get it out of their feeling. They've been isolated so much that they they put out a, a tweet or something and they just say, wear your mask and we're going to meet up under the Claiborne overpass, which is a famous street for the parades that we do. And I, that's what I'm, that's the power of music, you know. And uh, I wouldn't tell them to go out there because we're still dealing with COVID, but that just shows me how important music is and how powerful it is that people are willing to go out there just to have what the culture brings to the city, just to do it because they love it and they need to see the people dancing. And that's how important it is. And I think once we, I don't think it's ever gonna leave us. It's just in our blood that we have to do something. So uh, after a couple of months, they got out there. Would you say, uh, Bill? Yeah, I would say that the silence has been deafening here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this city has, it's just a city of sound. And, you know, yeah. that's just who we are. Yeah. But I, I would say that, and Troy referenced this earlier, we, you know, certain members of this community of a certain age have distinct memories of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Which, you know, to compare them is difficult, but there are some similarities. And one of them is that we kind of lean on our, our culture, on each other to get through it. And we almost, in New Orleans, we kind of know what to do when we're faced with challenging times. And that is we hold on, you know, to what we have here and to preserve and protect mm -hmm. it. So when you're talking about our mission as a foundation of preserving music and bringing it to the future, yeah. It's now it's more important now than it has ever been. And I know having lived through that Hurricane Katrina experience, I've seen firsthand what music and community, when it comes together to face adversity, what it can do. Because the, re the recovery of the city of New Orleans from Katrina was about people and was about culture. Mm. We were down here with the city pretty much devastated. 90% of it was underwater. And over time, gradually, it came back. And yeah. then it reached a point maybe two, three years after that storm where in many ways we were stronger than we had ever been. Mm -hmm. Because I think we realized what we have, we embraced it and we used it. We used that power of that culture and the power of our community to push us forward. So it's hard here as it is everywhere. You know, New Orleans is not unique like we were during Katrina. 
but I think we have that experience. And like Troy said, that resiliency that we know we have here yeah. that can really push us forward right now. And, and it's a, it's a blessing that, that we have this beautiful culture to, yeah. to sustain us. I love that. I love that. Thank you for walking through that. And thank you for bringing it back to the mission of Trombone Surety Foundation, because that's also the conversation I was hoping to have with you all today. I want to open it up in a moment for questions from the audience. So for people out there, please go ahead and use the Q&A chat to get your uh, questions ready so we can dive in. But part of what I want to uh, talk to you both about beforehand is um, I, I want to go, I want to connect this idea of historical resiliency, lessons learned, how the, the community of New Orleans has really learned to come together and count on each other. And I'd be curious to hear from both of you, what are you seeing in the next generation of young artists and young musicians that are coming up in Trombone Shorty Foundation? Are, are they, are they, do, do they seem to understand that? Are they tapped into it? Does it become a part of their education as an artist, part of their journey? Just curious, when you talk about that culture, that history, that knowledge and way of being in community, how is that reflected in the next generation of artists that come through Trombone Shorty Foundation? Uh, I think I it's something start with that. Oh, go I'll ahead, try. Bill. Try. No, no, I'll follow you, go ahead. I, I was just, okay, I was gonna say that when our students come to us, they're pretty young. They're in ninth grade. So if you think back to when you were in ninth grade, your frame of reference on the world <laughs> is relatively limited. Yeah. What we find that happens with almost every student that comes through our programs is somewhere along the line, they realize in a, in a real way that they are a part of this legacy and they might not know that going into it. And we do things like we travel with our students. We went to Cuba this year. We went to Los Angeles last year. And when New Orleans musicians go someplace else, mm -hmm. they're celebrated as heroes because people around the world love that music. So tapping them into the, the fact that they are now the, you know, the torch is being passed to them. When mm -hmm. that light goes on, that's a powerful moment. Troy probably had it at like age five. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was about I was about to say that uh, I, I think uh, most of the kids might not understand that they're a part of it, uh, but they definitely feel it, and and it's just a natural thing that happens around the city, uh, the culture. Everybody, I think we're born into it, and we don't realize it until we're not here anymore that we're a part of that. So it's just a natural thing. And, and like Bill said, I, I was probably headed around five or something like that. But there's a bunch of other people that I can name that came up just like me and we're here today. So I, I just think it's, it's in the blood of the people in New Orleans that the culture is that strong. Yeah. And yeah. I, I would add to it that, you know, at the heart of what we do is mentorship. So our, our students spend time with professional musicians who are recording, touring, performing musicians who go all over the world. But beyond just what we do, another one of New Orleans' greatest strengths is that, and this gets back to the cultural thing, how do you keep a culture strong? It doesn't do it on its own. You have to actively pass that culture on or it, it doesn't work, you know? And so it's hard to put your finger on it and Troy might be able to explain it better than I could, but something happens here organically with the older folks, they just intuitively know it is their job yeah. to do that. And which I, you know, I think played a big part in why Troy decided to start this foundation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's an unspoken tradition that we pass down the knowledge. I'm still getting taught by some of the older musicians uh, today. Even if they see me in the street or they call me, or I call them and ask them for things. It's just an unspoken tradition that happens. And, it's, and we, we, they led by example, and it's natural for us to follow them to pass that information along. And uh, as far as the culture go, like the culture of New Orleans really grows in the street of the city. Of the city. And what I'm doing with the Trombone Shorty Foundation is being able, because I grew up in the Treme where I had millions of musicians around me, every other house was a, music, a musician. Uh, and after the storm, after Katrina, all of that kind of went away. So I wanted to be able to keep that same vibe and reach children that's not from Treme, but that may be from Slidell or Covington or Uptown that didn't have the experience and won't have the experience 
that 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 special experience of Trim May because every neighborhood is so different that mm -hmm. you know we have some neighborhood neighborhoods uptown that may be uh, very powerful and strong in the Mardi Gras Indian culture than it is than in an actual brass band or um, um, playing instruments, but it might be the, the the shouting and the drums that happens that that they can teach us about that comes from that neighborhood. But I just wanted to give the kids an opportunity uh, as I've been performing for my whole life, there's things and knowledge that I've gained that sometimes in New Orleans, what I've experienced is that we have a lot of people that know how to make music, but they doesn't necessarily, uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily understand the music business part of it. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes can, can, can stifle one's career because they're going into professional situations off of uh, uh, guessing. And, and, you know, and, and then when they're guessing, they hear these stories about people being cheated out of their money or something. So they already come into a situation with a defense thing that can ultimately hurt their career. So what I want to do and, and what we're doing in the Trombone Shorty Foundation is we not only do we teach them music from professional musicians like Bill say that travel, that's a part of the community, but we also teach them the music business side of it to where when they get into situations, it's not a foreign thing that they're experiencing for the first time. So we wanna give them that knowledge. And also, uh, as I've experienced going to NOCA, the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts and any type of music program that I was a part of as a kid, not everyone turns out to be a musician. Some of them may come out to be managers, role managers, staging guys, uh, and some of them may be coming to the production side of it to where they become engineers and uh, producers and things like that. And I just wanted to lay out in, in the academy all of those options for the kids. And we wanted to lay that on, on the table so they can have a, a better chance of whatever they want to do in the music industry. And I just, it's, it's, it's my goal to make sure that it's, it's, it's bigger than me. Like when I'm, when I'm dead and gone, hopefully the foundation will continue to help birth the next, next generation of New Orleans musicians, our musicians around the world that we can keep music and arts as, as powerful as it, it is in, in life right now. I love that. I, I feel almost overwhelmed with this vision that you're describing, Troy. It's aspirational and to me, because um, it articulates the greatest hope that we could ever have as adults thinking about how can we pour into the next generation and then I will just say at the same time when I think about the fact that all children deserve that level of education that level of pouring into that level of development I wish that so many more young people can experience that I'm going to go to the questions that we're getting from the audience in a second but the question that I have just given how passionately both of you talk about culture, um, the transition of culture, the sharing of culture and the teaching of the next generation. Part of what I'd be really curious to hear you, you talk about. So given our audience and the work that people in our network do, it is about bringing together cross system and cross sector leaders to improve education and careers. It's really at its core, it's about giving young people skills. But in order for people, in order for communities to help do that skill building successfully, they have to convince everyone the truth is they have to convince everyone that these all are our children and that as a generation, we are either going to profit from or pay for what they become. That's, that's not me, that's James Baldwin. These all are our children. We will either profit from or pay for what they become. What you both have described is the belief that these all are our children and we must give them these skills so that they can go forward. I wonder what advice or guidance you would give to someone in a community who's trying to convince um, anyone who sits at a different system, who is politically not aligned, who just thinks differently about you know, our children. What, if, like, what advice would you give them for why it's so important to make sure that the type of training you're doing is important for all children to access? Well, uh, I think, uh... This type of training, I'm just going to use music, but I think giving the kids an opportunity to to be expressive through music, it also, like I was saying, some of the some of the some of the kids that don't end up being musicians, they can take that same discipline and same learning and apply that to other parts of life, 
whatever that may be. Like when we got to get him, we have to practice for eight hours. If you're going to be a lawyer, you have to put that same discipline into studying. And so I think the tools that we're giving the kids today and what I've learned in my life is still very uh, dominant in the way that I live. And, and like you said, it, they're all of our children. So we have to do what we have to do to make sure that they have the tools to be able to make the world a better place and enhance it and move it forward. And I, I would add to that that, well, look, New Orleans is certainly not without its problems. There's no doubt about that. However, as we look at where things are in the world right now and in this country where there's a lot of division, yeah. um, and that's a real problem. I think we here, getting back to something I said earlier, is that New Orleans is a great model in, in, in one way right now as we look to work our way through this of unifying a group of people who are not all the same. We are a very diverse you know, culture here in the city, but New Orleans is a wonderful job of, of you know, bringing people together. Yeah. And, and music is one of the ways that we do that. We also do it through food, we do it through our shared way of speaking. We speak kind of our own language down here and we all know what everyone's saying. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something I think that is so important right now is celebrating, looking at our differences as something that, is a, that, that brings us together rather than pushes us apart. And when you can bring it together and everybody gets along you know, and celebrates those differences, that's a beautiful thing. And when you see it like at a second line in New Orleans, which is basically a big street parade, you literally see two-year-olds to 92-year-olds mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. in the street, dancing, celebrating, you know, back then hugging each other. Um, and, you know, what a great uh, model for society when, 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 a, when a group of people can do that and celebrate together. So I think, I think the country has a lot to learn from New Orleans right now. I couldn't agree more. That's why we wanted to have this conversation with the two of you today. So now I'm gonna to pivot to questions we've gotten from the audience. And I wanna start with this first one here that says, can you speak a little to the way that arts and music can both be a catalyst to mobilize and a way to collectively heal? So this conversation we've been having, but part of this question is, can you speak specifically to the role that music plays as for mobilizing and healing as we approach an election and a time in which so many people are hurting around the country? Uh, I think music, when, when I'm around the world and I'm playing uh, for 90 minutes to show you how powerful music is, uh, mm -hmm. there's people of all races there. Like Bill was just saying, from two years old, from white or black, uh, Spanish, European, whatever it may be, that's how powerful. And whenever I come on stage and I look and I see that all over the world, that's, that's the power of music. Before we even play one note, just people coming together um, to come and enjoy something. Yeah. I think music is the way that we, like, uh, like Bill was saying about people should follow New Orleans. I think music is that, and it can be that around the world. And if we just listen to the music, and, and just come together, I think we can all heal and, and become one as the music does for me for 90 minutes. Now, the goal is to make that 90 minutes last for every minute of life and bring everyone together and we can collaborate in, in a beautiful harmony and see that we all speak music, the, the language of music. And I think it's, it's very healing, you know, like even when I go to concerts and I'm not a part of it, I just, you know, something might be so good. You're high-fiving your neighbor next to you like if you're at a basketball game. And in that moment, it's very genuine. So we just need to figure out a way to where we can continue to let music and uh, guide us into a more genuine place with one another. Mm. I love that. Bill, is there anything you want to add to that before we go? Yeah, I, I, I would say, so I, I believe that, you know, if we look hundreds of years into the future, but wherever our society is at that point, mm -hmm. when the people that are documenting the past, the historians, yep. look back at this time and challenging times in our country's history, the 1960s, I mean, the, the music and the art that has come out of those experiences speak to it in the most um, 
deeply profound way and they show and it shows us the light you know in the darkness it is the it's the artists in our society that show us how to get out of it so you know i think that you know a lot of the creativity that we're starting to see right now and a lot of it's modified people are having to do it in a different way we're having to do this in a different way that artistically what you're going to see come out of this time i believe is going to be really powerful um so you know i i i would say pay attention to the music and the art that you're seeing around you because it's 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 going to show us the way through you know to that point someone someone put in the chat um very specifically that she saw you troy perform oh holy night on tv after katrina and that that moved her heart deeply. Like in that moment of feeling so significantly, profoundly hurt, it did the thing that you were saying that music does, you know? So I just, one, wanna share that. And two, connect that to what Bill just shared, because I would say, absolutely, when we think about the work that we're supporting communities to, to do, we spend a lot of time talking about policies. We spend a lot of time looking at data and designing strategy. But we also, without question, spend time centering the lived experience, advice, and guidance of young adults. And we also, like we're doing right now in this conversation, we absolutely integrate the arts. We bring in artists to help us make sense, to help us make meaning, to help us collectively problem solve in ways that are restorative, in ways that tap into healing, in ways that build community. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. So I wanna go to another question from the audience, but um, one thing that we did get in that actually also ties to and builds to this point is someone said, can the panelists reflect on the fact that artists throughout history are often revolutionary and they work to uplift the challenges that society is facing. So, so to that point, Bill, you just made, but they may not necessarily get their due, their credit, or even see the results of their vision during their lifetime. Again, you know, when you, Bill, you just said it, that we'll look back on this time and see that so much of how we understood this time and made our way through this time would have been through the, through music and the arts. So just curious if you guys have any additional thoughts, reactions, or response to this comment before we move on to the next question. Um, well, I would say, you know, I, I think if you look at some of the music that was made in the 1960s and early 70s, when our country was, you know, it was another challenging time. Things like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, early some Stevie Wonder, Curtis Mayfield. This is music made by Black Americans yeah. that is timeless. Yeah. You know, here a band in, the, in New Orleans called The Meters, who one of Troy's biggest influence. Um, you know, that music spoke to that time, but it's it, at the same time, it, it's as relevant today as it was then. So those artists had varying degrees of recognition at the time, you know, of, of how embraced their music was or how understood it was. But over time, some of that stand rises because it, it, it is, it does have such a timeless quality and it speaks to the struggles of humanity that are always going to be there, you know, and that is as powerful of a way as I can identify to uplift myself through struggle is beautiful music. Yeah. And I know that, you know, the music Troy makes is, is, a, is a great modern example of that. That's what that music does, brings us up, it lifts us higher. I love that. Troy, anything you wanna add before we move on to the next question? I think Bill, and he got it all right. <laughs> he did. I was trying to think of something, but he, he took the words out of my mouth. He did do it. He did do a great job. So um, going back to the audience questions again, one question we got is, how have you stayed connected with your community throughout the silence? And did you find that during that time of silence, was it more about the community seeking you out or did you have to actively do outreach to maintain awareness and just continue to, you know, stay focused on your music? Uh, for me, you know, I, like I said, in New Orleans, like I don't think we have to, uh, reach out is just a language that we have. And whenever it's, it's open for us to get back together, we take the first shot at doing that. Um, 
like the community runs through our blood, our bodies, everything, and it like builds is like a language. For me, um, we just all, you know, the silence is hard, but we're just taking the time to really take this thing serious. And, and when it's all over, we'll be right back where it is like nothing never happened. So uh, for me, just staying in the studio, staying active, everybody's going through their own things at this time. And I'm sure that we'll all get back together soon, but I haven't actively, uh, it, it's already there. You know, I, I, I was born into New Orleans, music happened a hundred years before I was born and I'm just here. So it, it's already there, you know, um, the, the connection and the love that we have that won't ever go anywhere. And that, that gives us hope and let us know that we'll all connect as soon as we're able to get back. And I would say briefly to add to that, that, you know, it's a challenge right now, especially for people like us down here that are used to being out in the street dancing and, you know, spending you know, time with each other, like moving everything virtually like you've done with this convening here. Let's be honest, it's not easy. You know, this is not an ideal situation, mm -mm. but it's what we have to do right now. Mm -hmm. you know, and we're, yeah. we're all making it work. And I want to just do a, you know, quickly a, a shout out to all, not just the, the leaders, the community leaders in the audience, but the, the young people, like mm -hmm. this is hard, you know, we're all, we're all experiencing it. And, um, you know, they're, I mean, it, I, I'll tell you what, it does bring us all together though, because nobody's escaping this right now. No. So, um, you know, we're going to persevere through it. And I know getting back to what we've experienced with Hurricane Katrina and that coming back after that, we have faith here. But uh, I just feel like I have to acknowledge that this is not an easy time. And I know that the work everyone does there is deeply affected by it. And ours is too. And you know what, Bill, I was just thinking about that uh, and how you said things are moving virtually. I think what we experience in New Orleans is probably the only thing that we can't make virtually like a second line and being in the street. So it's definitely hard for us. We can get on here and we can chat with one another, but even for us to really make music together, uh, it's very hard virtually. So you, you're right. And when we talk about the, the culture here, like we can't get the Mardi Gras Indians on, on, on Zoom and, and feel what we do. It's just, it, we have to be outside and we have to be together. So as, as we have to wait this time out uh, in order for us to get back to what we need to do. We did, uh, we had a, got Troy and his band together a couple days ago inside the Superdome here to do a, a recording. And when they all started playing, it, it hit me so hard. I was like, it has been, how long has it been? It's been six months, it's been half a year since any of us have been together hearing wow. live music. Wow. But it was That's it was right. powerful. It was amazing to 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 share that again with 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 our people. I can imagine there were tears. Like there must be like a, a, a like a something about it that feels surreal in terms of like that thing that you were missing that you forgot that you were missing because we have music, right? We can listen to music. I can play Al Green tonight while I'm making dinner. But what Troy was saying about when people are together listening to live music being performed and that connection that you have with each other as you are vibing that music and you feel it in your body, you feel it in your heart, you feel inspired and you also feel that everybody around you feels all of those things as well. So I can only imagine how in some ways it might have been cathartic to get people together at a live performance recently. Especially yeah, it was, yeah, yeah it, it was a lot of fun. You know, we played, but there was no audience. So once yeah. again, uh, just to play with the band, we all of naturally, if there's no audience, we all love each other and we all cheer for one another, somebody <laughs> take a solo. So we had to create that vibe like we normally do, uh, no matter what, when we perform. And I think that's what the people can see, but it it, uh, it, it definitely was a great time. I, I'm glad we didn't play as long as we normally play because we all <laughs> out of shape, but it was a beautiful, a beautiful moment for all of us to get back and, even though we couldn't really hug each other like that, we spoke through the music. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hugged each other with the music. So we have two more questions I'd love to, to share with both of you and just hear your thoughts on uh, before we um, 
just do some final reflections and wrap up. So one question we got in is specific to New Orleans and the intersection of some of the different themes we've touched on. So the question we got is New Orleans was one of the first cities to recently embrace taking down the taking down of Confederate statues. It is a city with deep racial inequity dating back to slavery. How do you think about the intersection of race, justice and music as you work with young people in the Trombone Shorty Foundation? I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, well, that was our friend Mitch Landrew that led the charge to take those down. Um, I think it was a statement that brought us together, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a people. And it's interesting because there's all these conversations that have spun off about who actually should be up there. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, you know, it's, I think we all, or many of us agree here, it's people like Fads Domino and Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes black New Orleanians that have defined our city, that are real heroes, that have brought people together, that have expressed freedom through their art. Um, so we have a long list here of, of our local heroes, both alive and, and, and passed on, that could probably stand at the at those spots and that we as a, as a group of people in New Orleans would celebrate that. Um, and again, it gets back to the power of music. Yeah. Like New Orleans and, and you know, Troy can certainly speak to this. His band is, you know, incredibly diverse as far as, you know, racial, racially. Mm -hmm. um, music cuts all that down, you know, yeah. it, it, it washes that away. If you can play music and you can speak that language, you are, you know, you're, you're, you're one. So I, I think we, you know, as, as we as a, a culture in New Orleans, fit, you know, face some of these issues, we luckily have the backdrop of our deeply rich culture we can draw upon to know what, what it means to bring people together here and to move it forward. And again, music has played a major role in our development and is why the city is so special. And is yeah. that part of the education? Oh, Troy, please go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I was just agreeing with Bill. Go ahead. Well, and so I was curious, though, you know, the, the second part of the question was about how that gets translated to um, the education of the next generation of musicians. So as you talk about that, Bill, I guess I was just curious to hear, is that part of the education and training that musicians coming through Trombone Shorty Foundation are have access to? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, it's really you can't really teach music here without dealing with the past and the heroes of the past. And I know Troy can, you know, like when I hear Troy play or when I hear, you know, a great New Orleans artist play, I'm hearing a lot of different sounds in that one sound. And that some of it goes back to early jazz, modern hip hop. I mean, Troy, you know, the music you make, how would you, how would you even describe the mixture of, influences well like you were just saying like here we can't like you said we can't teach music without without representing or uh, even understanding where we're coming from so in order for i always tell the young musicians always go back and learn what the older musicians did and what the foundation was that they led in order for you to understand where you put it it's like learning abcs like you got to learn these things to be able to speak so we want to pay attention to what, what the older musicians did and, and follow that guideline. And then we can see, once we learn that, we can see how to get to the next part of what our foundation would be for the next hundred years. And, and kids will be looking at the music that we come from, uh, that we created, but we also understand what happened uh, with the Meters and the Neville Brothers, Fats Domino, Professor Longhair. And I always tell the kids, I would love you to learn all of this so you can understand the lineage of New Orleans music and how I got to the sound that I'm at. But I, I don't want, I, I encourage them not to become those people. Like let's, let's respect what they did, learn from it and take everything that you like from that style of music and put that into your gumbo pot of music that you wanna do and your interpretation of, of New Orleans music for the next whatever 50 years. But I think my music is just basically, uh, it's experiences. It's, it's my experience from working with Manny Fresh and Juvenile, working with the great Dr. John and 
mm-hmm. the Neville brothers and then going with working with a uh, cowboy mouth, uh, uh, working with some of the bounce artists here, uh, DJ Jubilee and, and, and different people like that. I've, I've been able to work with uh, a large array of artists in New Orleans that represent subgenres of New Orleans music. Uh, and I've been able to, I've, I've been able to bring that together on stage with me. Because even though we in one city, sometimes uh, I've never seen like juvenile on stage with a, a brass band or things like that. And, and I was able to do that and, and bring us all together with some of my friends, uh, partners in crime and just create one music. So when you hear my music, you hear me spending time in all of those genres of music in New Orleans and then it all comes out. Mm. You know, where you went, thank you for that, Troy, where you went was actually where I want to close us, which is your advice and guidance for the next generation of young adults who don't have access to Trombone Shorty Foundation, but really want to find their way. And what I really heard you talking about was understanding history and let that be your foundation while also at the same time exercising your own agency to really chart your past, I mean, excuse me, your path. You have to understand the past in order to move into the future and understanding that path will, past will be so key to how you plan what your, your pathway is gonna look like. I feel like that's what you just said, but I, I wanna really invite you to share your closing reflection and Bill, I want you to also share your closing reflection in response to that question. But before we do, we got one tactical question um, related to the Trombo and Surety Foundation that I just wanna make sure we ask because given the work that our communities do, I do think it's gonna be really valuable for our network to just hear your responses to this. So the question is, can you share more about the specific strategies you all are using to engage youth in the art and music programs at Trombo and Surety Foundation? And also how have you been able to secure funding to support your work? Sure. The um... As far as strategies, uh, you know, well, you know, getting back to what Troy was talking about earlier, you know, and it's developing a sense of purpose. I think if if you were to strip away all the different elements of what we do, we're connecting young members of our community with a sense of purpose, and then creating a pathway to move forward with that. Mm-hmm. It may be music. Music might be a catalyst to something else. Mm-hmm. And the more that that experience, that learning experience can be hands-on, mm-hmm. can be real world focused, so to speak. So mm-hmm. it's not just a, you know, it's not just in the classroom and the work we've been able to do with you all and the Hilton Foundation has offered apprenticeships. So our students then go out into the community, work with local businesses, get to know the business side. So mm. it, it's, I would say it's, it's, an, it's a combination of nurturing their talent and what they're passionate about. Yeah. And then creating a robust pathway for them to move forward with that passion. And hopefully sooner rather than later develop a, you know, a professional vision for where they want to go. Yeah. You know, and so this can be start to, you know, be their livelihood and they can go out and make a living doing what they love. What better life purpose is there than to do that? So at our best, that's what we do. I love that purpose, pathway, and then vision. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any thoughts or response to the fundraising question? Uh, Oh, the fundraising. Final question. I mean, you know, to the fundraisers out there, you know, uh, it's hard right now. It's hard because everybody's experiencing their own situation and it's different for everyone. Um, the best thing I can say about that is that, tr- you know, trying to diversify it as much as possible and to communicate with those people that have been your supporters. Um, so there's been an extra heavy lift on that side of things over the last six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to, I don't think right now funders are looking for perfection. I think they're looking for resiliency and innovation. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. so that's what we, you know, that's what we're doing. We're rolling up our sleeves, we're adapting, we're, we're changing things to meet the moment. And, uh, you know, luckily Troy, because he is able to, or, you know, 
until this started tours all over the world mm. he's been able to help open doors to you know different organizations and individuals not just in new orleans because that can be hard too if you're just relying on your own community yeah. um so i would you know as as much diversification as possible on the funding front um is kind of the order of the day right now i love that Thank you. Thank you for that advice. It's hard out here. And I think, and as much as we can share tips, tricks, et cetera, um, it's really helpful. So thank you for that. So here's what I'd like to close with. I have already uh, alluded to it. Um, when I think about who's in our network and really um, the, the goal of our network, which is to promote better outcomes for young adults, 16 to 24, who are out of school and out of work, and how so much of the solutions that we promote are really about the vision that young people hold for themselves, young people hold for their families, young people hold for their communities. You know, Troy, I, I heard you talking about, uh, the way I heard it was really the legacy of Trombone Shorty Foundation, you know, this, your, your life work being handed down generationally so that other musicians can grow up with the foundational knowledge that has shaped so much of who you are and the artist that you are. Given the young people in our network and this notion that they really must find their way. And once again, finding their way is in part tied to the past. I couldn't agree more. Understanding the truth about our past is so key to how young people can then think about, so who do I wanna be? And maybe more importantly, what impact do I wanna have on the world? What's the vision that I hold and how can I move forward every single day that vision? I think it's probably fair to say when I think about the young people in our network, so much of how they think about a vision is very much around inclusivity. It's very much around belonging. It is very much about the collective we how we build community together and how that community loves, supports and nurtures each other. But the other thing I would say, and it was a significant part of the conversation I wanted to have with you both this evening, it's also how we heal from the past. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention that because even as we talked about the different experiences that have happened in New Orleans between Katrina and now COVID-19, it seems to me that part of our collective work and especially as we think about supporting the next generation to achieve their goals, so much of what we have to teach is not just history, but how do we heal from those things that may have either hurt us or may have kept us fundamentally off of our life path. So when I think about the legacy of what you are building at Trombone Shorty Foundation, the way that you are globally connecting with the next generation of artists, it's not only profound, it's so key to how we continue. When I think about the solutions our country needs, I think about your work and I think it's a key part of the solution. So this final question, Troy and Bill, is just what guidance, what advice would you give to a young adult who may not have access to Trombone and Shorty Foundation, may not have necessarily music skills to develop, um, may not have had success in a traditional education setting. Certainly during this current um, crisis, they're not able to connect with employment, but they do hold a vision for themselves, for their families and their communities. What advice, as you reflect on your own path, your own life, and especially build the work at Trombone and Shorty Foundation, what advice would you give to those young people and the adults working in partnership to serve those young people? Well, I think uh, the one word that comes to mind is passion. You know, for me, uh, I've never played music to, to become famous or be some type of superstar, or even make money at that sense. I, I just literally, literally have been playing since I was four years old. And my passion is always to just make some type of noise. And I wanna be the best that I can be. And when, and when you're passionate about something, whatever that is, the passion will guide you to the extents and lengths that you need to get to because you're so much in love with what you wanna do that you'll go on that path and, and stay up 20 hours a day trying to achieve what it is, whatever information it may be, because there's a lot of musicians I know that didn't go to college, but taught themselves, but did the proper amount of studying on their own to develop that discipline to be right there with the people that had those traditional types of uh, educational settings. So I would say just be passionate about whatever, whatever it is you want to do in life. 
and that that should lead lead you where you want to be and open the doors for other information for you to acquire uh, other information. But it, I, passion is what it is for me, one hundred percent. Like you know what you want to do, and and be passionate about it. It may not pay off in certain ways or uh, whatever you think it may be, but if you are true to whatever it is that you believe in. I think it will guide you where you need to be and people will be able to see how genuine you are dedicated, how genuine, genuine you are and dedicated to your passion. And that will open up the doors for people and for yourself. So I think, I think if you can work in the name of passion, everything else should fall in the line. I love that. Thank you. Bill, I want to come to you, but I wanted to just say this, Troy. It reminds me, it makes me think, you know, you said make some type of noise. Makes me think about John Lewis encouraging everybody to get into good trouble. You know, like when you know that there's this thing that you should be doing, go ahead and follow that thing. You know, that's like the cousin of what you said, or that those two messages in my mind and in my heart are adjacent about um, really supporting young people to be able to be guided in their paths. Thank you so much for that. Bill? Thank you. Yeah, you know, you mentioned John Lewis and there, you know, we're talking about an American hero there who influenced so many people. What we've created is, is essentially a, um, a model where mentorship is, uh, you know, the, our students experience mentorship at a very high level, you know, and we pick our instructors very carefully. They're leaders in the community. So to answer your question, what I would say to, to young people out there, mm -hmm. find your heroes. They're out there. They're living amongst us. They're in our communities. They're people that have walked the path before us that know more than us that, that are there to show us the way. Um, you know, I look at my own life and that, you know, I think we all can identify a handful of people that without their guidance and their involvement in our lives, we wouldn't be who we are today. That is, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. You know, the saying is it takes a village. Um, and I think without question, and especially when we, the work we have invested in our network, it's not just the village that you have around you. It's actually the village that helps you transition from, you know, being a young adult into, you know, early adulthood, secondary and post-secondary into careers. But it's about the community that helps with all of those transitions that really, I think, guide you into successful adulthood. But what's most important is that that success is self-defined by the young people that we partner with. So um, I don't know if you guys have any final reflections, anything burning that either of you wanna share before we officially wrap up, but I know that I do wanna say on behalf of our national network um, across the United States, that it has been such an honor to be in this dialogue. And I said this at the top with my comments, you know, so much of our conversation right now is very much about the power of place um, and how particularly in this moment our country is in, how we double down on resiliency, how we double down on, on healing and how we are essentially in community with each other. And so just, thinking about your work, thinking about your legacy, thinking about what it is that you all are bringing so intentionally to the next generation. We couldn't have more valuable lessons to take away from this conversation today that are gonna be so important to tap, in, tap into in the weeks and months ahead. I'm just really thankful to both of you. So Thank good you. to be with you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I didn't even realize how much I needed to do something and this has made my whole day. So I feel really great. And thank you for having me. The pleasure and honor is all mine. And I, I would add, Monique, that if anybody wants to check out Troy and his band, their very first performance since this pandemic started, eight o'clock central at the Trauma and Shorty Foundation website, we'll be going live this Saturday night. So you'll hear from some of our students, some of the other great musicians in our community. Um, It'll be a lot of fun. And I know everybody on our team has been really looking forward to this. Virtual Shorty Fest is what it's called. So feel free to come check it out. So you can hear, uh, you can hear it for yourself. Excuse the bad notes I might play up there. Oh, goodness. 
We know there won't be bad notes, but I will say that is literally music to our ears. We, we are hungry for that. We look forward to listening in and thank you both again for your time today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.